I get emotional talking about my knee. <laughs> Ready? Pull! Fit fam, welcome back to my channel. I'm super excited to have you because today we're gonna do something special. We're gonna talk about money. If you are new to my channel, go ahead and take a look at my other videos, see if you like them. Go ahead and subscribe if you'd like to. I would love to have you stick around. If you're a returning subscriber, welcome, welcome. I have had a lot of interest in my ACL uh, reconstruction, repair, kind of just like the ins and outs, and I have had two ACL reconstructions. So depending on how much I decide to talk, um, I might just make this into two separate videos. I might do surgery number one in one video, surgery number two in the other, and then that way we can kind of separate them because they are so very, very different. So just to kind of start off, um, let me just give you a little bit of background and then I can kind of give you the scary, not so much fun, information and I will try and insert as many pictures and things as I can a lot of the stuff is on my Instagram and so I will attach my handle down below it is just pancakes and weights on insta when I remade my channel um, I deleted all of my my previous videos that I have been making for years um, I didn't really have all that many but it did have a lot of my recovery from my first surgery on there and I didn't want a constant reminder of all of that stuff and so if you were a subscriber before and you saw that stuff at least you kind of have an idea as to how it felt in that moment now that I am recovered from it um, I'm still recovering from my second surgery but now that I'm recovered from the first surgery mentally physically um, the best I can I guess I don't want to remember the painful part of it I I can kind of remember, it's like one of those pains that you forget. Um, it's kind of like getting a tattoo. It hurts when it's happening and when it's healing and it's a little sore, you know, and it it's not something that I want to remember vividly. And when I watched those videos, it just brought back a lot of painful memories, you know, not the good kind, not the kind where I can look now and say, wow, I really overcame a lot. I looked back at them and I was like, wow, that girl was in a lot of pain. So we're gonna start at the beginning. Buckle up, sit back. It's probably gonna be a long one. For that I apologize, but I hope that this can help one of you. So a little bit of background on myself. I am a semi-retired bodybuilder, um, bikini bodybuilder um, in bodybuilding. If you're not uh, familiar with it, there's different stages for women. There's bikini, figure, physique, bodybuilding. I was at the bottom of the food chain. I had just started working out and so I didn't really know a whole lot about strength training. I just wanted to get on stage and look pretty. And so I had just come off of my second bodybuilding show when I decided that bikini wasn't for me. I felt like I wanted to get bigger, I wanted to experience more, and I wanted to stand out. I wanted people to look at me the way I looked at them when I walked into athlete check-in at those bodybuilding shows. I would just sit back and I'd see all these women and they looked beautiful. Their muscles that they worked so hard for, it was, they were chiseled, they were lean. It was awesome to see firsthand, you know. Yeah, it's awesome to see them on stage, but when you see them back behind stage, that's cool. Like it's, it's definitely an experience that, I don't know if everybody should experience it or not, but if you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. Being at the bottom of the food chain from bikini and I saw all these awesome women I wanted to be one of them I got done with my second bodybuilding show and I was like I'm gonna take a nice long off season I'm going to do some research and find something that works for me in my off season I at the time I was completely self-taught I taught myself nutrition I taught myself posing I taught myself um, how to lift weights <laughs> and so I I did it all. I wanted more. I knew that there was more out there. I just didn't know how to get it. So I sat down on my computer one night and I just Googled and I typed in everything I could think of. Everything but strength training because at the time I didn't know what that was. Like I, I knew what it was at the gym. I just didn't know how to 
find it. I didn't know what to type in. I didn't know what to look for. I just knew that I wanted to get muscle. But like, how do you type that into Google? You know, get muscle for women. <laughs> I It probably took me a month, month and a half of really searching, you know, deep down. Like I, I looked at karate. I looked at different forms of bodybuilding. I looked at CrossFit. I looked at pole dancing classes. I legit searched everything. And then in my area, because I am born and raised Iowa girl, in my area, it was extremely hard to find those things. They just weren't available um, unless you wanted to drive really far. I found a gym and they had something called Strongman. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it entailed, but they had like some pictures and stuff. And I, I Googled a little bit more in depth and it looked really cool. It looked like something I definitely could not do because it just was a lot of weight. I contacted the gym and they actually told me that they train more power lifters. And um, if I wanted more strongman type training, they recommended me to the, the next gym, which was actually probably about 20 minutes closer to my house, which wasn't really a big difference because it was still an hour, a dri hour drive. And so I contacted the gym. No response. Contacted the gym again. No response. I probably sent them stalker type emails for three, maybe four weeks when finally someone at my hometown gym said that they went to college with one of the trainers at the gym and they told me his name. I stalked him and I got a hold of him finally and he told me when to come in. I went in. It was awesome. Oh man, it was awesome. <laughs> the equipment, the people, the environment was something I had to be a part of. And I was like, this is it for me. This is what I need. I will get huge here. <laughs> Little did I know at the time that for women to get huge, <laughs> it's not quite so easy. I set up a time I set up a training schedule and I went back. I had probably been training for a month, if even maybe three weeks. We were running a keg and um, I will try and find a clip of it and I'll insert it. So what running a keg is, is it's legit a beer keg that's been emptied. They refill it with sand or water or gravel, whatever heavy substance, they plug it and then that's what it is. It's a legit keg. My coach at the time told me to grab the 135 keg and run it just, you know, from the end of the building to the other end. And I did to grab the 175 keg. So it's 175 pounds. At the time I was maybe 125 pounds. I did it. I grabbed the keg. I ran it to the end and when you set the keg down, you set it on its end. So you're not um, setting it down on like the, the circular part, you're setting it down on either its top or its bottom or whatever. I dropped it just like any other time and I dropped it on my right foot. I immediately pulled my foot out from underneath the keg and it had wobbled because it's, the flat side is down here. And so it was sitting kind of at an angle when I pulled my foot out, it rocked and it rocked into my left me. At the time it hurt. It hurt bad. Like it kind of just felt like if you've ever jumped off something and misjudged the distance, it just kind of felt like you jammed it. You know, it didn't pop. It didn't crack. It didn't do any of that. It just felt like I had jammed it and that was it. I went home a little bit later and I remember driving home. I was like, man, my knee, it hurts. A month, two months go by and man, my knee really hurt. It didn't hurt all the time. It just hurt when I did certain things. It was painful to run on it. It stung, it burned, it would pop and crack and just make old age noises. I, you know, I'm 31 now, but at the time I was, I might have just turned 29. So it was just, you know, one of those things you're like, man, I'm getting old. Little did I know that that wasn't the case at all, but I, went to the doctor. I had to do an x-ray first and 
Then after that, they sent me to get an MRI. The MRI came back, and I was actually misdiagnosed by the doctor's assistant. I don't know if it was the surgeon that had originally diagnosed it or if maybe she did. I'm not entirely sure, but all I know is the very first time I went in, I got a lot of mixed messages. She told me that my ACL might be torn. She's not sure, but it's kind of looking more like a ganglion cyst. And if you don't know what that is, it's basically a pocket of fluid underneath the skin. It can be in joints. It can be just right underneath your skin so you could see it if it was like on your hand or something but mine was in in the joint and at the time i pretty much just blacked out what she was saying i just stopped listening because i was just done i guess i heard what i not necessarily what i wanted to hear but i heard enough to begin to break my heart <laughs> and that sounds silly but if you're an athlete and something substantial happens to you that could potentially take you out forever for a season for anything it's it's like this slow process that I just picture my heart melting <laughs> and then it's just in a pile on the floor <laughs> and then I have to like mop it up I, I just was done listening and Somehow, I ended up going back to the doctor. I ended up seeing my actual surgeon. That was when he told me that it was actually, in fact, an ACL tear. It was like 95% torn. I didn't have all the symptoms of normal ACL tear. Um, it didn't feel like how they were explaining it. When it happened, it didn't pop, it didn't snap, it didn't crack. It just felt like I jammed it. And so my surgeon said that I could wait a while. I could see how it goes. If it is a partial tear, that maybe it'll heal on its own. Maybe a little bit my my meniscus might be involved. Maybe it wasn't. He just couldn't give me straight answers. He told me what he thought. My heart was just breaking. But my only thought when this was happening was I need to fix it. I need to fix it now. I, if surgery is going to fix it, surgery, give me surgery. And I just remember I was being very adamant about surgery because I needed to get back on my feet and get going. I had lost a lot of mobility during the time where I was in pain, like before I had gone to the surgeon, before I got the MRI, I was just in a lot of random spurts of pain. My mobility wasn't there. I wasn't able to kneel. I was personal training at the time outside of my regular job and it was hurting my personal training business because I couldn't accurately show my clients how to do things because my leg just wouldn't let me. <laughs> I couldn't kneel, I couldn't crawl, I couldn't get down on the floor with them and if I did get on the floor with them, I, how am I gonna get back up? I couldn't get back up. I had to shimmy around on the floor until I found something and I could pull myself up. My only thought was I need surgery I need it now and I need it to fix me. Then I decided that I was going to compete uh, in my first strongman competition. I had just got started. I had just gotten into the strongman world. I wanted to do something before I could potentially not be able to do something ever again. I've heard horror stories about ACLs taking out big time athletes, NFL players, NBA players, and their career is done. But at the time, that's all I could focus on was my athletic career was over. I wasn't going to let that stop me from competing once, once more. And so I did the competition. It was seven months after my diagnosis that I competed. And I think I got like third or fourth place. It wasn't anything fantastic, but considering I did it injured, it's fine. It... I did what I needed to do. I, I accomplished what I wanted to. And the next week or a week and a half later, I had surgery. I don't know about you, but I have a fairly high pain tolerance or what I think is a high pain tolerance. Um, a portion of my body is covered in very, very in-depth tattoos. And sometimes tattoos are not exactly enjoyable. And so I believe I have a decent pain tolerance. Nothing compares 
to the first ACL surgery that I had. I will insert some clips for you guys to get a full visual as to what they do. So if you are getting ready to have an ACL surgery, don't let this scare you. If it's needed, it's needed. Take it like a champ. And just remember that you're going to come out much, much stronger at the end of the day because now you can say that you are a badass for being able to go under and come out the other side in one of the most painful recoveries out there. I believe your uh, rotator cuff and your ACL recovery is a couple of the most painful recoveries it doesn't quite compare to a lot of things. It doesn't compare to a knee replacement. It doesn't compare to a broken bone. It just does not compare. And I've heard also other people say that it was a piece of cake. I think maybe age might play a part in that. Um, your ability to tolerate the pain. Also, if you're physically active or not. I think I could tolerate the pain a lot better than if I was like 80. I did not handle it well. I will tell you that much. When I woke up from surgery, um, they just make sure that you can eat, hold down the food, and that you're able to stand up. I was in the, uh, it was an outpatient procedure. I was in and out after my surgery, probably like six hours or so after I'd woke up. I just remember the nurse coming in and, you know, asking me if I'm ready. I really wanted to get out of there because who wants to hang out in a hospital room? Nobody. I woke up in this leg brace. It was already on. Underneath it, your leg is wrapped up like a mummy. And so you can't feel anything, generally, if you are having some pretty substantial pain medicine. I do, however, recommend getting a pain block. I got the option to get a pain block, and I am very, very glad that I did because it did kind of hold off the pain until a little bit later that afternoon. But when it did hit, it hit hard. Just a little FYI. The pain block is, they put it in your groin and basically it just numbs from your groin down to your foot. That way it, it just, so it's not such a shock to your system when you do wake up. The nurse said that the doctor had requested that I get up and on my feet as quickly as possible because that I just need to start the healing process. You know, laying in bed and sulking about it is definitely not going to start anything. I needed to get up and get going and the more pressure I could put on my leg, uh, the better. And I told the nurse that I am absolutely going to need some crutches. Uh, I don't think I can walk and she said, it's crazy, the surgeon said you'll be fine, that you know he doesn't want you to have any crutches. I just remember standing up my dad was there, he helped me get up. The nurse was in front of me, my dad was then behind me because uh, they had to get you into a wheelchair. So he was helping to get me up and so I could get turned and set in the wheelchair so that way I could leave. And I just remember I stood up and in a split second, I just started going down. I had no stability whatsoever. I had no strength. It was like I had no limb. And my dad caught me. The nurse was in front of me. She kind of caught my hands. She lets me sit back down. She said, you need crutches. Wow, could have told you that one. So don't let them mess around with anything like that. You will need your crutches, absolutely. So I, I go home. The pain block wore off later that day. They gave me two types of pain medication. They gave me hydrocodone and oxycodone. They told me to keep on a schedule every four hours I needed to take one of my pain pills and to make sure to stay on top of the pain because once you get kind of behind it's hard to get caught up which is a hundred percent the truth once the pain is there it is so so hard to get rid of I cried a lot a lot the person that was taking care of me um, actually ended up calling the the nurse line or whatever and asking if there was anything that they could do because I just, I was hysterical. Um, nothing was helping. Propping my leg up didn't help. Letting it kind of drop down didn't help. The ice machine that they gave me no, didn't touch it. I physically could not wait 
until the next time I needed to take my um, my pain medicine because it it was so so painful it was the worst pain I've ever been in my whole life I can't even group it in with something I later learned why it was so painful which I'll tell you about the nurse line did say that I could take aspirin in between my my four hours so I was supposed to take my heavy uh, pain pain pill my oxy or my hydrocodone every four hours I could take an aspirin at two hours that was a godsend so if they don't tell you that you can make sure to ask your doctor obviously to make sure that you can but it, it was an option for me so it might be for you too it sounds really silly but it almost felt like the aspirin worked better than any of the hard pain pills I don't know why that is maybe my tolerance I'm not sure but the aspirin saved me a hundred percent had I googled this stuff before I had surgery it would have scared the surgery right out of me I wouldn't even have I wouldn't even have had surgery um, I did a cadaver graft which is a dead person's ACL they gave me a size 10 which is the largest size that they can give a woman so what they do is they have to bore a hole through your knee in order to stuff the tendon inside. That way they can attach it. Picture your knee like so. They screw it up here at the top and then they screw it down here at the bottom. And so your knee is right in between. They have to put a hole through so that way they can anchor it on either side. And how they do that is here is your knee. This is my example knee. They drill a hole through the bone. Yes, the bone. That is why it was so painful because it's through the bone. So they drill it in. They flare out the drill bit and bore it out backwards. And so the reason behind that is, is that they have to have a hole large enough to put the tendon in so they can't just stuff it in a, a small hole and hope for the best they actually have to have enough room to actually put it in there and use the utensils to anchor it on each side so I have a button on each side of my knee there are different options when you get your ACL you can have a hamstring graft a cadaver graft like me and then they also I think that there's one more but my surgeon did not give me a third option. I have a friend of mine who actually had an ACL also. They gave him three options. I just got the two. Hindsight, well, <laughs> hind hindsight, I wouldn't have got the surgery at all. Since I did have the surgery, I always told anybody I talked to that if I had the option to do it all over again, if I had another surgery, I would completely remove the ACL altogether because I heard of a NFL player that actually had his removed completely and his quad muscle took over for his knee. He was able to be just fine. I'm not entirely sure what that's going to say about your knee in 20 or 30 years because bone on bone is not good. He'll probably have to have a full knee replacement. But I just remember if I would have had the option to have no ACL at all, I probably would have picked that the first time. But I did pick the cadaver graft. And I picked that because they didn't actually have to cut into my knee. They actually used uh, a, the scope procedure type deal. Um, so they, I have four scars on my leg and two of them are actually the scope itself or the, the prods, I guess, so that they could do whatever they needed to do inside and then I have two larger scars where they actually put the material into my knee well took out the bad and then replaced it with the good so I do have more scars than the average but they're not nearly as big as if you would get the hamstring graft and the hamstring graft is they actually take it from your body so you're less likely to reject it because it's your own tissue so they take it from your hamstring, which is behind your leg, and they actually cut up the knee itself. And I didn't want that because I was like, oh God, I'm a bodybuilder. I can't have a huge scar on my knee for one. And for two, I crawl around on the floor a lot with my clients. I need to be able to get off the floor, not 
not to mention I'm doing strongman now. Like, what if I'm doing something on the floor? What if I hit the front of my knee and it just takes me out? I'm like, there's no way I can have something, a huge gaping wound on the front of my leg. And so that is actually why I chose to do the cadaver graft. The cadaver graft, it is not your tissue. I will tell you that right now. You are physically receiving tissue from a donor. And so it has to be cleaned, it has to be processed. Next, I would like to kind of just tell you guys about the brace itself, what you can expect with the brace. I was to wear this for approximately six to nine weeks. It does lock, so you see this little lever right here? And so it's locked, so you can't bend it at all. And then it, oops, and then it flips back shut. That way you can adjust it. You can see this lever right here this adjusts that this is for your physical therapist or your doctor to adjust that this is going to decide how much of a bend you can put in your leg at all do you have any idea how hard it is to relearn how to walk when you're 30 years old i've been walking for almost 30 years and suddenly i can't it's not that my mind doesn't know how it's that my body won't let me it's not going to come easy either so please just let your doctor or your physical therapist do this. You don't want to give yourself too much slack and then end up hurting yourself when your knee is not ready. Your knee will tell you when you're ready. Trust me on that. You lay your leg inside here. It closes around your leg and then it has the straps that buckle. These do remove so they are washable. FYI, you're going to want to wash them because you're going to stink. Um, it is extremely hard to shower right away after you get done with surgery, probably for a few weeks. Um, somebody had to help me shower for almost two weeks, and it was like every third day, every other day, until I was able to kind of get going by myself. So I had to sit down in the shower and hang my leg out. I wrapped it with saran wrap, but I did graduate from this, and I soon was given this. So it is much, much smaller. I think it's actually like this. So it's mid quad up here, and then this is mid shin versus this one, that this is your entire leg. This goes from ankle basically up to your crotch. This is an athletic brace. If you are an athlete or in high school and you're doing athletics, definitely ask about this one. I don't know if you can read that or not. It's Townsend is what it says. Um, it's metal, so it's very, very sturdy. They personalize this for you, so they make it to fit you. And if your leg grows, which it will because you're going to lose a lot of size, if your leg grows, just take this back in and they can adjust it for you. Don't you try to. The only difference is that this goes on the front of your leg. This is going to go around the back. So the big one, the straps are on the front of your leg. This little one, oops, the straps are on the back. This can go over your jeans, over leggings. You can wear it uh, with shorts, anything like that. Very, very easy to use. This is a little bit more difficult. My problem with this is if I wore pants with this, um, the brace was so heavy, it pulled my pants down with it, so I had to hike it up a lot. And so this is much easier to go with shorts. I'm going to end this video, maybe get back into my second ACL surgery a little bit later, but I just wanted to cover the basics with you guys. Just be hopeful. That's my best advice for you guys is it's hard. It's very, very hard. It's a big deal. Thinking that it's not is where I think people go wrong. That's what happened to me. But I thought I could bounce back like that because I was healthy. I ate really well. My head was too big for my shoulders, we'll just say. And my surgery and my recovery brought me back down to earth. I thought I was unstoppable. I thought I was great. I thought I was awesome. What I found out now is that I'm still awesome. But I'm awesome for a different reason. I'm awesome because I came back after not one, but two ACL surgeries. And that in itself is so much more. I am probably lost a lot of opportunity. Sponsors get very, very scared off. If you got hurt because if you get hurt once you can get hurt again you're no longer important to them because you are a liability and I'm going to tell you that is not the truth you are 
more important now because you are strong enough to get through an injury and to make the decisions of how you're going to move forward. I made the decision with my surgeon what kind of surgery I was going to have for my ACL. I made the decision to be proactive about my situation and nobody can take that away from you. Not even a sponsor, not a scholarship, not anything. And it's hard to let that get you down because when you come out of the other side, you're going to be very proud of yourself. So if you just need somebody to talk to, because I know I did, and I didn't have that, and you're having a hard time because it's a major surgery, it's going to determine the rest of your life. Don't take it lightly, but just remember you're not alone. So thank you all for staying with me this far if you made it. And please comment below if you need anything at all. So thank you guys. Please subscribe to my channel and uh, I'll catch you next time.